Oh, good afternoon, everyone. For those who are in Facebook, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to Ateneo de Manila, Department of Economics, and Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development Seminar Series. Our topic for this afternoon is Asia's Journey to Prosperity, Policy, Market, and Technology over 50 years. Before I introduce the speaker, um, let me just give you some house rule when, uh, as we conduct this seminar. Next, please. So our house rules, we will let the speaker finish his presentation first before we entertain questions. But for those in Zoom who may have some clarificatory questions, I think our speaker would welcome those clarificatory questions as we move on along the presentation. For Zoom participants, please stay muted and stop sharing your video during the duration of the presentation. During the Q&A, you may virtually raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. You may unmute yourself when asking your questions. For participants on Facebook, please post your questions in the comment sections. We will prioritize asking the question with the most number of likes in, ca in case we have several um, questions. due to limited time. Um, okay, let me now introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Zhu Zhong Zhuang, who is a former Deputy Chief Economist at ADB. He was a research officer of the Development Economics, Economics Research Program at the London School of Economics. He has written extensively on Asian development and edited and co-edited a number of books um, including inclusive growth toward a, towards a harmonious society in China, among others that you see on the screen. Um, he is also the lead author of a number of ADB publications, including the economics of climate change in Southeast Asia, confronting rising inequality in Asia and growing beyond the low cost advantage, how China can avoid the middle income trap. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Manchester. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Zhu Zhong Zhuang. Dr. Zhuang, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, for the kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the economics department for the opportunity to present this ADB's new book, Issues uh, Journey to Prosperity, Policy, Market, and Technology over 50 Years. Now, I have to say that uh, this book came out of a three year long study led by ADB's Economic Research Department, and it has involved many ADB staff, including external experts from in and outside Asia as well, and including the Professor Habiti and from the Economics Department here in the Zoom room. Now, in the 1960, uh, Asia was very poor, and uh, feeding a large and growing population was a critical challenge. And then there was a pessimism on Asia's prospect, prospect of industrialization and uh, broader development at that time. You know, we, uh, as described in uh, uh, Ghana Medau's book, Asian Drama, some of you may know. Uh, se uh, now, the half century on, Asia has emerged as a center of a global dynamism. So what can explain Asia's economic success in the past 50 years? So this book attempts to address this question. Uh, I have to say that there are many studies on Asian development. One well-known example is the World Bank's East Asian Miracle Report, published in 1993. The ADB books uh, the, differs from the World Bank report in two major aspects. One is that the ADB book covers the entire developing Asia. So, you know, it, developing Asia consists of ADB's 46 developing member economies in East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, and Pacific Islands. While the World Bank report only covers eight economies in East and Southeast Asia. Number two is that the ADB book covers a much longer time period, about 50 to 60 years, while the World Bank report only covers about 30 years from 1960 to 1980s. 
Next slide, please. Uh, the book, uh, previous actually, the book has 15 chapters. Uh, as you can see from, the, from this table of contents, it covers uh, almost all major topics of the development economics. Presenting a 600 page long book covering all these topics in 45 to 40, in 35 to 40 minutes is a challenging job. So next slide. So my presentation today will focus on four issues. The first is to highlight Asia's key development achievements in the last in the past 50 years. The second is to ask what explains Asia's economic success. The third is to discuss several issues that have been heavily debated in discussions on Asian development. Finally, I will mention briefly Asia's challenges ahead. Let me clarify that uh, this book was released in January 2020 before the start of a COVID-19 pandemic. So the book did not have any discussion on COVID-19 related you know, top issues. However, I believe that the policy conclusion of the, of the book remained valid before and after the COVID-19. I should also say that I am presenting the book as one of the book authors, not as an ADB staff, because I retired from ADB from, uh, since last month. Next slide. Next, yeah. Now this chart on the left shows from 1960 to 2018, developing Asia's average per capita GDP grew at 4.7% annually compared with less than 2% for the world as a whole. So as a result, developing Asia's share in global GDP rose from 4% in 1960 to 24% in 2018, as shown by the bar chart, pie charts on the right. If including Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and Japan, Asia's share rose from 13% to 34%. So basically, over 60 years time, Asia's share rose from 13% to 34%. Next slide. The rapid growth has also led to dramatic improvements in Asia's broader development indicators. Now, for instance, the proportion of population living in extreme poverty declined from 60 68% in 1980 to 7% in 2015 as shown in the second row. Life expectancy at the birth rose from 45 years in 1960 to 72 years in 2018, as shown in the third row. And the last row shows that uh, the average year of schooling for population aged 20 to 24 rose from 3.5 to almost nine years. So basically during this period of time, mean year average year of schooling for population aged 20 to 24 rose from 3.5 to almost nine years. So these are indeed very impressive achievements. Next slide. So what can explain, explain Asia's economic success? Obviously many factors we are at play. One is peace and stability, especially after the Vietnam War. Asia was much more peaceful, and stable since Second World War and compared with the previous 100 years. Previous 100 years, you know, characterized by colonization and the war with the conflicts. Peace and stability led to rapid population growth, creating favorable demographic conditions and allowing many countries many economies to benefit from demographic dividend. So the region's share of working age population, the share of working age population rose from 55% in 1960 to 70% in 2018. Then there is the free trade investment policies adopted by advanced countries, especially after the 1970s. This also allowed Asian economies to, put, to benefit from technological progress and uh, globalization. Further, a low income level provided the potential to grow faster to catch up due to the so-called convergence process. However, even with the peace and stability, favorable demographic and external conditions, the process of a catch up growth is not automatic. So it's, even with this good content, all the uh, 
peace and stability and uh, the, you know, the demographics, uh, favorable demographics and external conditions. The process of catch up growth is not automatic. So the book is argued, the book in the book, we argue that the issues economic success owes much to creating better policies and stronger institutions. So let me now explain what these policies are. Next. First, successful Asian economies all relied on markets and the private sector as engines of growth. At the same time, the state has also played, the government the state has also played a proactive role in addressing market failures and in coordinating development. Now, roughly, roughly speaking, the issue, issue's history after World War II can be divided into five phases, roughly, you know. The first phase is from late 1940s to late 50s, when development policy in the region was very much dominated by state-led industrialization and import substitution. The second phase is from the late 50s to late 70s, when Japan and later on the four NIEs, the newly industrialized economies, namely Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, so they shifted to export promotion and market-led growth. But meanwhile, China, India, and many other countries were still on state planning and inward-looking policies. So this is the, the period from phase from late 50 to late 70. And then the next phase is the, from late 70 to early 90s, when the first wave of opening and market oriented reform started in China, in Vietnam, in India, and in Central Asia. So next phase, the fourth phase is from the early 90, 90, 90s to 2007, when opening and market oriented reform were broadened region wide and trade capital flows grow rapidly, but there was a setback due to the Asian financial crisis and there were significant, significant efforts of post-crisis reforms in many countries. The last phase, the fifth phase is from 2008 to present time, but before the COVID-19 issue was affected by the global financial crisis, but moderately only. And after the crisis, issue has been leading global growth. Now, a review of these development phases suggests that the market oriented reforms and opening to the outside world were always followed by rapid economic growth. Whether it is in NIEs, I mentioned for economies, NIEs, whether in China, Vietnam, or South Asia. At the same time, governments remain proactive in promoting development in many high performing Asian economies. But the law of the government is not to substitute the private sector and the markets, rather is to support the, support the private sector and make markets to work better. So the conclusion of the book is that the sustaining growth and poverty reduction require efficient markets and effective state as well as the strong institutions. So that is uh, uh, one of the chapters deal with the role of the market, the state and uh, institutions uh, in the book. Next slide. The second policy area underlying Asia's success is promoting structural transformation. So we all know that uh, structural transformation has been a key uh, driver of growth and development across the world, whether it's developed world or developing countries. Now, a stylized fact about structural transformation is that over time, Resources are transferred from traditional agricultural sector to modern industries and the service sector. As shown by the top right charts, where we see output and employment shares of the three sectors change as the country's income rises. Asia has followed this pattern, but the pace of the transformation has been much faster. Of course, there are large variations within, within the region. The bottom right chart shows that from 1970 to 2018, developing issues, agricultural employment declined from 71% to 34%. Industry employment increased from 14% to 26%. And service employment increased from 15% to 41%. Next slide. 
Now, the structure transformation also involves shifting from low productivity production, low productivity production, to high productivity production. Within each of the three sectors, the three sectors is the, the basically the agriculture and manufacturing industry and the services. So, within each of the three sectors, the, uh, the, the shift from low productivity pro, low productivity production to high productivity production, slow techno technological advances. Now, to facilitate technological progress, many Asian economies first adopted foreign technology by using a variety of ways. For instance, uh, um, you know, inviting foreign experts in sending students abroad, buy foreign license and uh, licenses, import machinery, and uh, engaging, of course, engaging in trade and, uh, and attracting FDI. So this is initially the line of foreign technologies, you know, uh, through a variety of ways to, to, to get to, to, to adopt foreign technology. But over time, they started to innovate on their own by investing in R&D. So Japan and Korea provide good examples in early years. The bottom right chart, the bottom right chart shows the case of Japan from 1950 to 1980s. Japan's R&D spending as a share of GNP increased steadily while net import bills of foreign technology technologies as a share of GNP declined over time. So basically over time, the, 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 the spending on R&D based innovation became more and more important. So now uh, China and many others are following this road. Now, Asia's progress in technology innovation has been dramatic. It has transformed itself from a user of foreign patents to major producers of patents too. The chart on the, in the middle compares the top five economies globally in terms of the annual number of granted patents in the United States in 2015 with those in the 1960s. So you can see that in the 1960s, the top five economies include Germany, UK, France, uh, Japan, and Canada. So basically the top five uh, uh, economies, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of number of annual number of uh, granted patents in the United States. And by 2015, the top five included the Japan, Korea, Germany, uh, Taiwan, and uh, China. So there's a significant shift in terms of uh, importance of the patents, uh, granted patents uh, in, uh, in the United States. Next slide. The third policy area contributing to Asia's economic success is investing in productive capacity. The table on the, right, on the left shows that from 1960 to 2017, developing Asia's physical capital stock grow at 7% per annum from 4 trillion to 176 trillion US dollar. Uh, so basically from 2 trillion US dollar increased to 176 trillion US dollar. This measured at 2011 constant US dollar. Uh, the chart on the right shows that the most of this investment was financed by domestic savings, so domestic savings by Asian countries, Asian economy. Developing Asia's gross domestic savings rate rose from 18% in the 1960 to 41% in 2010s. Uh, so this has been driven by mainly by rapid economic growth, by favorable demog demographic conditions, and by, by policies to promote household savings, for instance, postal savings, and uh, prudent fiscal management. In the 1960s, Low savings and a lack of capital and foreign exchange were common problems in Asia. Since 1990s, Asia's savings rate exceeded investment rate. So savings rate is higher than was high, become higher than investment rate. So meaning Asia as a whole runs current account surplus. But of course, there are large country valuations. Uh, most South Asian countries continue to run current current account surplus uh, deficit. Uh, South Asia continued, current account deficit is a problem, continue to be a problem. But Asia as a whole is a current account of surplus, you know, surplus country, uh, region. Next. One important aspect of physical capital investment is infrastructure. 
Many Asian countries and economies invested heavily to improve infrastructure. For instance, during 1971 to 2018, per capita electricity generation is per capita electricity, electricity generation increased by 35 times in Korea, 30 times in China, 19 times in Thailand, and 14 times in Malaysia, 14 times in Malaysia. In comparison, it only doubled in OECD countries on average and only tripled for the world as a whole. So obviously, infrastructure investment alleviated the production net bottlenecks and improved living standards. Next slide. The fourth policy area is building human capital. Successful Asian economies all made efforts to build human capital by investing in education and uh, skill training. Key policy measures include making education a basic right of every citizen, introducing compulsory education program, public investment in schools and education system reforms. The chart on the left shows that from 1970s to 2010s, Asia's public spending on education increased, increased from 2.1% of GDP to 3.6% of GDP. So it's a quite a significant increase. As a result of these policy measures, most Asian economies achieved universal or new, new, new universal access to, private, to primary schools, and many achieved universal or new universal access to secondary schools. And there were also significant expansions in tertiary education, as shown by the chart on the right, which presents growth in enrollment rates for secondary and tertiary education. Next slide. The fifth policy area that has contributed to Asia's economic success is open trade and investment. Highly performing Asian economies all promoted trade and attracted FDI. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I mentioned earlier, after World War II, development policy in developing countries was very much influenced by the desire to gain economic independence. They, they got political independence and they want to have economic independence. So basically at that time, policy was very much influenced by, influenced by the desire to gain economic independence from the, uh, uh, the former colonial powers and also by economic thinking at that time, such as the big push and the dependency theory. So many countries pursued the uh, import substitution industrialization strategy. But of course, this strategy did not work well. We all know that leading to inefficiency, inefficiency and in many cases, balance of payment crisis. So in Asia, NIEs, the newly industrialized economies I mentioned before, turned to export promotion from 1960s. Some of the Southeast Asian economies, including Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, from 1970s, and China and Vietnam from 1980s, and India from 1990s. So export promotion was often supported by government policies, such as access to foreign exchange, access to, to preferential finance, or tax exemptions. Now, as shown by the chart on the left, these economies initially export the labor intensive manufacturing product, such as textiles. And over time, they moved up to export a more sophisticated products, such as cars, electronics, and machines. In the last two to three decades, many Asian countries, Asian economies, had participated in global value chains, making the region a center of global manufacturing production. Now, during 1960 to 2018, Asia's exports and imports both grew at 11% annually. So basically during this period of time, both imports and exports grow at 11% annually. Uh, and then the ratio to GDP, the trade, the ratio of trade to GDP rose from 20% to 53%. To attract FDI, Many Asian economies set up special economic zones and provide tax incentives, making the region one of the most attractive FDI destinations. For instance, in 2017, developing Asia's inward FDI accounted for 35% of the world total, as shown by the chart on the, on the right. Next slide. The sixth policy area that has contributed to uh, Asia's economic success is prudent macroeconomic management. Over the past, past 50 years, 
compared with other developing regions of the world. Developing Asia did better in macroeconomic management, whether we look at growth fluctuations, we look at inflation, or we look at frequency of economic crisis, as shown by, by these charts. The 1997 Asian financial crisis was a wake up call, the crisis was, we, we, you know, we now know that the crisis was caused by currency and maturity mismatch and inefficient investment of falling, falling borrowings. After the crisis, many economists implemented structural reforms to improve macroeconomic management and strengthen financial sector. So economic recovery was fast and partly because of these reforms, developing Asia weathered the global financial crisis well. Next slide. The seventh policy uh, I want to highlight is promoting social inclusiveness. Rapid economic growth and targeted social policies, including, for instance, land reform and public spending on education, health, social protection, and improved access to finance, infrastructure, and the markets. Now, this all this led to rapid poverty reduction, which in turn helped to create a stable political, political environment for growth. The chart on the left shows a strong correlation between annual growth of a per capita GDP and annual reduction in poverty rate among Asian economies. However, Asia's picture is more mixed in narrowing income gaps in reducing income inequality. Asia has stable inequality in 1960s, 70s, 80s, a pattern you know, often we know as a, as a core as a growth with equity. This is basically in East Asia. The chart on the right shows that uh, in the 60s, uh, 70s, and 80s, many Asian economies experienced reduction in income inequality regardless of their economic growth. So basically, regardless of whether it's high or low, inequality declined at that time. However, since the 1990s, uh, high growth uh, in many countries has been accompanied by rising income inequality in Asia. Uh, that, that point I will touch on a bit more uh, later. Next slide. Finally, the Asia's uh, rapid economic uh, catch up has also benefited from bilateral and multilateral development assistance in terms of finance, in terms of knowledge and policy advice and also benefited from regional cooperation and integration. Uh, this has helped to maintain peace and stability in the region, expand into regional trade and investment, and promote the provision of regional public goods. Now, due to time constraints, I will not go into details. So let me skip this slide and the next slide. So next one, please, and the next. Yeah, OK. And now let me turn to the third part of my presentation looking at several issues that are often heavily debated in policy discussions in the context of Asia. And the first issue is whether Asia's development experience is unique. Now, some studies and scholars, and quite many actually, often consider Asia's development experience unique, or they think that uh, they argue there is an Asian development model, which emphasizes the role of the state interventions as opposed to the so-called Washington Consensus, which follows more closely with standard economic theory of a market economy. So Washington Consensus basically follows the more, more closely with the standard economic theory of market economies. And in the book, we argue that Asian economies in the, you know, the uh, most Asian economy in the past 50 years implemented policies and reform that are not very different from standard economic theory of market economies. If you go through the 10 policy recommendations of the, of the Washington Consensus listed in the table on the left. So in this sense, you know, whether it's fiscal discipline or public uh, expansion reform, tax reform, financial liberalization, all this. So in this sense, uh, the book argued that the, the Asian development is not unique. However, Asian economies, the many economies adopted a more gradual and programmatic approach to implementing policy reforms, including the practice of testing major policy changes before full scale implementation and a careful sequencing. So in this sense, we may say that the Asian development is unique. Next. 
The second issue I want to discuss uh, highlight a little bit is, is, is the law of industry policy. So many Asian economies use the industry policy to promote development. Now we know that so-called horizontal industry policy, uh, basically the support for education and infrastructure, for instance, has worked well by improving business environment. industry fixed the uh, successes as well as the failures. And the targeted industry policy was discredited after Asian financial crisis, but has received new attention in recent years. Now the book, we argue that uh, the targeted industry policy, if used badly, can lead to rent seeking, unfair competition and inefficiency. But if used wisely, it can be effective, especially in areas with strong positive spillovers and coordination problems, for instance, in uh, spare over innovation and the coordination problem, for instance, in the developing new industries. So today's high income countries, today's high income countries all use targeted industry policy in the early stage of their development. So we note that. The book also notes that targeted industry policy is more likely to succeed when it is performance based and it promotes competition with a clear targets, sunset clauses, and transparent implementation rules. But, and also as a country becomes more developed, industry policy should focus more on supporting R&D to promote technological innovation that are less, less in, in, intrusive and has a broader and uh, you know, stronger uh, the spillovers. Next slide. The third issue is whether industrialization can be bypassed. So many Asian economies achieved high growth by promoting manufacturing and exports. So larger capital investments are in the trade and FDI and education expansion. But the recent experiences show rapid growth can also be driven by a vibrant service sector. For instance, business process outsourcing enabled by advances in ICT and India and the Philippines were only, uh, only cited as two examples. And the two, two countries where manufacturing sector has been relatively lagged behind. Now, uh, this has led many to ask whether countries can make a direct transition from agriculture to services, bypassing manufacturing. Now, I have to say that the, the, the book did not provide a, de a, a definite answer to this question. But it noted that historically, manufacturing was important almost in all today's high income countries. So today's high income countries, uh, you know, the European countries or North American countries, uh, the early stage manufacturing were all important before they started deindustrialization. The book also noted a number of uh, attractive features of manufacturing it has a larger scope, for instance, it has a larger scope for trade and for generating foreign exchange and has a high income elasticity of, elasticity of demand, the larger scope for innovation and skill economy and it can create more better paying jobs. But of course, with the rapid technology change, things can change. But the book's recommendation is that the countries should rely on both manufacturing and service sector. Next slide. The last issue I would like to mention is the importance of institutions. Uh, developing Asia usually have relatively low scores on institution ratings, you know, the World Bank, the global, uh, the worldwide governance ratings, right? The, the, the rating, the scores, the institutional rating, governance ratings. So developing Asia usually have relatively low score on these ratings, but it's development performance is outstanding. So sometimes consider this as a paradox. The book notes that there is a positive association between quality of institutions and economic development as shown in, in this chart on the right. And Asia is no exception. But the book also notes that uh, this correlation may vary across different dimensions of institutions and it depends on a country's stage of development. For instance, at a low income stage, Igniting growth, you know, to ignite growth is a priority. And then government effectiveness and regulatory quality basis to attract private investment and control of corruption may be critical. 
as the country becomes more development, developed, the priority becomes sustaining growth. And with rising aspiration of the middle class, accountability, wider citizen participation could become more important. And uh, the book also notes that in some Asian countries, creating economies, creating a vision for the future that was shared across a wide spectrum of society and promoted by forward-looking leaders has made a difference, especially when backed by a competent bureaucracy. So this is also the point that we highlight. Next slide. Finally, let me briefly discuss issues, uh, challenges ahead. Uh, so the, the book is about the history. So we discussion on the future challenge is very brief. So my presentation was very brief. Despite the rapid growth and development, issues gap with advanced countries remain large. In 2018, for instance, developing Asia's per capita GDP was only 13% of the OECD average level. The challenges facing, facing many Asian economies include of course, at the moment, at this stage, the overcoming the current high, uh, the health crisis, right? The current uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis currently. And uh, then after that, the support uh, recovery. The second is to promote innovation-based growth, especially in countries where labor cost is rising and growth has to increase, economic growth has to increasingly rely on productivity improvements through innovation in order to avoid the so-called middle income trap. The third is to make growth more inclusive. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the rapid growth has been accompanied by a rising income inequality uh, in some countries like China, India, and Indonesia. So growth has to be more, uh, better, more inclusive. The fourth is to improve education quality and achieve universal health coverage. So in many countries, we noted that uh, the universal health coverage remains an uh, aspirational goal. So not, uh, not the level of coverage is still low. So there's a lot of uh, uh, mileage to go. And then the, 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 the fifth is reduce income, uh, the larger in, uh, infrastructure gaps. Uh, uh, despite the uh, rapid investment and the high investment in infrastructure in many countries, the gap remains large. Uh, the, you know, the ADB study showed that uh, uh, next 10 years, uh, uh, the Asia needs to invest 1.7 trillion US dollar annually in, uh, uh, in infrastructure on average. So 1.7 trillion is quite large. And then there's a need for protected environment and tackling climate change. Asia is now largest uh, source of CO2 emissions, for instance, so needs to be tackled and the local environment needs to be tackled. And finally is to respond to demographic change and population aging. So in countries like China and, and Singapore and Korea, and the population aging is can become a big problem, so it needs to be responded. Next slide. So the finally, I, I just uh, very briefly uh, uh, summarize. Uh, uh, so issues economic success owes much to creating bad policy and strong institutions. Uh, the book highlights the you know the, the, these eight areas. I already mentioned the detailed discussions, so I will not repeat. And uh, this policy, we think, is very important. Uh, uh, made a huge difference, you know, to, in terms of uh, Asia's economic performance. Going forward, Asia still faces many challenges, and there is no, no room for complacency. And and uh, and uh, so, Asia must continue to maintain good policy, strength, strong, strengthening institutions, and contribute to the development of science and technology and to tackle global issues currently, of course, is to fight the COVID-19 pa uh, pandemic. So uh, I think, uh, uh, let me stop from here. And uh, uh, okay, I, I turn the floor to the moderator. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zhuang, for that um, very extensive and informative presentation. I'm sure this opens up a lot of questions from our participants, both in Facebook and also in Zoom, especially now that we are in this pandemic. Uh, okay, I think we'll entertain question first from the Zoom participants. Um, somebody has a question, uh, one of our colleagues, um, Hil Diliaco, can you ask your question? You can show yourself and unmute yourself. Heal. Yeah. Are you there? Okay. Yes. Okay. So yes, 
Uh, hello, Dr. Chuan. Um, hello. Thank you very much for that book. Um, I found the pre presentation very interesting. Um, I have a number of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. the several of them really pertain to uh, country examples. It's more like uh, you had a pro um, stated a number of uh, conclusions, and I was wondering if you can provide us some specific examples. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in one issue, you said uh, in, in some Asian economies, creating a vision for the future that shared that was shared across a wide spectrum of society and promoted by forward-looking leaders made a difference, especially when backed by a com competent bureaucracy. Uh, which economies uh, exemplify this characterization? Uh, very good question. I, I think uh, often we talk about the Korea, South Korea as one example, and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore is another example, yeah. Okay. And another is um, on the uniqueness of Asian development. And another example, maybe uh, I can say Sorry. China, for instance, Deng Xiaoping, the, after uh, uh, you know, 70, uh, 1978 and started the form process. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. So uh, again, going through country examples, um, you said that uh, on the uniqueness of Asian development, Asian economies adopted a more gradual and pragmatic approach to implementing policy reforms, including the practice of testing major policy changes uh, before full-scale implementation and careful sequencing. Uh, what is a good country example of the effective practice of testing major policy changes? Uh, I think in this case, China certainly is, uh, is, is, is a good example. Uh, in China, for instance, uh, economic reform, rural reform uh, uh, start uh, in, a, in a, a, late 70s and early 80s, start the, the test, you know, the pilot in a few provinces before uh, 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 expand to the entire entire country, uh, rural reform and uh, SOE reform. Uh, so, so that, I, I, and, and then of course, uh, 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 opening and the special economic zone and these are all kind of a testing first and then expand, uh, uh, expand in other areas, other province. But the Lulu reform certainly is a, <clears throat> is a very well-known examples. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, one final question on country examples. You talked about uh, targeted industrial policies, that there can be good examples and there can be bad examples. Uh, so what is a good country example for a targeted industrial policy? Good examples, I think Korea and Japan um, provide a good, quite a number of good examples, right? That uh, 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 the electronics, for instance, in Korea, the, the, and uh, Japan, uh, many high tech, uh, you know, uh, 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 the manufacturing goods mm -hmm. and car industries, uh, early stage government support, of course, later on, in, the com in terms of the car industry in Japan, for instance, uh, earlier government state support, but later on, that uh, let uh, uh, producers to compete, and also domestic producers to compete. So that kind of uh, that uh, you know the the experience, uh, quite uh, uh, good examples. And the bad examples, uh, it's, it's more difficult for me to say the bad example. But often cited is uh, in Malaysia from the car industry in in Malaysia. Uh, often you know mentioned as a bad example. But the uh, question, of course. Uh, 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 as I said, the bad export is <laughs> more difficult to to to, to criticize. Yeah. To <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, can I ask two more questions, or mm. should I give way to others? <laughs> Sorry, Maha, you. Okay. Maha, uh, can you unmute yourself? Go ahead, you. Okay. Thank you. So, just uh, two more questions. Uh, one is. Um, you said that uh, Asian structural transformation proceeded at a faster pace. Uh, what do you think explains this this faster pace of structural uh, 
transformation? Uh, I, I think uh, fast pace, uh, yes, because of the, all the, the policies uh, with, I discussed, I highlight, right? That the, these are the policy drivers because the structure transformation itself is a process, is a driver of growth. So, uh, uh, and then needs to be driven by the policies. Policy, you know, as I mentioned, the rely on the markets and private sector and uh, 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 education infrastructure, mm -hmm. all this made, uh, uh, you know, the macroeconomic uh, management, uh, uh, you know, these are all important for the, the, the faster pace of the structure transformation. And uh, one final question. Okay. Um, and this is probably, I was taking to heart your assignment, Maha, so I prepared questions. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, this last one so may not be, you did say that this is uh, through 2018, so it does not include the recent developments. Mm. But uh, maybe I'm going to ask a question anyway, and maybe this requires an entirely new study, but here's the question. It is said that the pandemic has reversed many development gains. Uh, do you see these reversals as tentative? How can they be regained in the future? Uh, as I said, the book, uh, we, the cut off uh, period actually is uh, October 2019 or something, it depends on the data, right? So we launched in uh, 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 generally this year. So before the uh, break out of the pandemic. So we don't have any discussions uh, on, on, on this COVID-19 pandemic, as I mentioned earlier. But as I said, the policy conclusions, uh, you know, uh, highlight in the book, the main valid, uh, you know, it, whether you're talking about the lion market and private sector and law of the government, right? So we, we mentioned the law of the government and education, you know, the health, all this is so the basic policy conclusions remain, uh, remain valid even before, after the pandemic. Uh, the question on the how, when, how the, the pandemic, pandemic will end, uh, I, I think, uh, 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 of course, to some, to a large extent, it depends on whether we can, uh, have a reliable vaccine right, and the treatment. But uh, these two things looks promising now uh, from my point of view. And uh, so uh, according to uh, uh, projections of recent projections of International Monetary Fund, they, they, their assumption about the future prospect of global economy is that uh, uh, with uh, 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 next year, 2021, uh, 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 20, uh, social distance will remain uh, important. But over time, uh, the intensity of social distance probably will decline over time. And they project, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 the pandemic will be under control by end of 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2022 by end of 2022. And so I, I think this is a kind of a cautiously, I would say a optimistic kind of a, a assumption. This is the assumption they used for their growth projection and they project global GDP growth will uh, uh, grow by, I think the 3.5% 3, 3, 3 or 4% around that. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Just a follow up question. Mm. Um, so you think that this uh, this uh, gains, this development gains in Asia? I'm sorry, uh, the growth projection is for for next year, not for this year. No, uh -huh. this year they project the growth, global growth will decline by four percent yeah. by four percent. Yeah, decline. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you. That's the final question. Um, oh, sorry, follow up. You can can we go back to you because there are already other questions. Can we go back to you? Oh sure, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, there's another question from um, Dean Nandi. Would you like to ask your question? Dean Nandi? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, um, please ask your question. What, 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 what were the major reasons uh, why inequality worsened from the 90s? Uh, and are you talking about 
inequality within or across countries in Asia? Okay. So uh, actually, we, we, here we are talking about uh, inequality within country. Across the country is actually inequality has been declining, right? Because of the uh, uh, high growth rate of the emerging and developing countries. So, you know, the income gaps have been declining uh, across countries. But within countries, uh, within many countries, inequality has been rising uh, since 1990s, as mentioned. Uh, example, for instance, China and India and uh, Indonesia. Uh, in terms of drivers, factors, reasons, actually, there are multiple uh, uh, reasons. Uh, for instance, there's a larger increasing income gap between skilled and unskilled workers and a rising uh, uh, income gap between uh, capital owners and the laborers, laborers and capital owners. So, you know, that, uh, and also there's increasing uh, urban rural income gap in some countries in China, particularly, and the regional inequality. So, uh, now we often uh, 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 this attribute this to this uh, globalization and, uh, and the technology, especially technology progress, you know, technology progress as being pro capital and uh, pro skills, basically. So uh, uh, that caused, income. but, but I, I think uh, to a large extent, uh, also because of the, uh, the rising inequality is a part of a development process, right? Because uh, we know that uh, the higher growth will not start from same, uh, all the places at the same time. So we started, for instance, uh, you start from uh, the areas, you know, the, the rapid economic growth started from areas where we have a good infrastructure and before it spread to the other areas. So, so, so basically the part of the development process, but, all, but of course uh, I have to say that to require the policy attentions and uh, uh, the inequality in opportunities can be a problem needs to be addressed. So overall it is basically the multiple factors causing uh, inequality to rise in, uh, in, in, in several Asian countries. Thank you, Dr. Swan. Hi, thank you. Okay, um, th thanks for that question. There's a question from um, and our audience on Facebook. This is from Francis Iga. Thank you, Francis, for sending this question. I'll try to shorten it. Uh, here is his question. There are many Asian countries where informal relationships have been the guiding principles for business development or have impacted greatly the latter. Uh, he gave an example of Guanzi in China, and this has built social and human capital a lot. Um, the question is, in what, in what way can government policies guide the development of human and social capital in informal relationship-laden countries? I see. Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, the institutions, uh, when we're talking about institutions, uh, we, we, we talk about the formal institutions like uh, laws and the legal framework uh, and informal, basically, as you mentioned, the relationships and the trust or, you know, the kind of uh, uh, the attributes, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I know that uh, the, there are many studies highlight the importance of informal uh, uh, institutions uh, in uh, in you know in terms of Asian development and uh, the Guanxi, for instance, right? So, uh, but uh, and then the social capital issue, right? The, the trust, uh, you know, among the members of society. So, so uh, that that I, I think that the, the issue, of course, is uh, 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 over time and. Uh, I think informal institutions remain, will remain important over time. And by the same time, if there are weaknesses in formal institutions, uh, I, I think we need to address, uh, uh, you know, uh, through, through policy reforms, through institutional reforms, and, uh, and uh, uh, the formal institutions, I, I think this is very important. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, I mentioned, uh, 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 there are the ratings, you know, uh, of, of, of institutional ratings, the governance ratings related basically the, 
mostly related to formal institutions. The Asians score many countries are still relatively low. And, uh, and uh, of course, I mean, the, the, this rating themselves can be, uh, can be debated, right? Can be, uh, you know, the problems is the shortcomings. Uh, but overall, as a whole, my view is that there is a need for improving formal institutions in many Asian countries. There's a large mileage there. Uh, so that uh, you know, uh, uh, make growth more more sustainable and uh, more more more, uh, more re resilient, right? I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other question from those who are in Zoom? You can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Heel, you may ask your one your other question. Uh, this is actually a follow-up. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a follow-up question to to the question on the pandemic. And then the question was, um, do you think, Dr. Swang, that the 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 achievements in structural transformation provide strong foundations for resilience? Because people are saying that uh, to overcome the pandemic and future ones. Uh, there should really be a focus on resilience. So my question was, does this development experience provide those strong foundations? Uh, sorry, I, I actually I did not uh, get the uh, yeah. So so basically, the relationship between uh, pandemics and resilience. Uh, the, the, that the that the structural transformation, the development gains. Mm. provide uh, strong foundations for uh, oh, i see yeah mm. yeah so certainly that the uh, development uh, you know the the brings the structural transformation uh, basically improve living standards uh, in terms of healthcare for instance uh, in terms of education uh, 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 of course material life so so these are all important uh, uh, and uh, as a part of uh, a country's cap capacity uh, to respond to pandemic like uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, in a capacity, right? So that, that is basically a country's capacity to respond uh, depend on, on people basically. So, uh, and all depend on technology. So all development brings technology and development improves uh, uh, the, the uh, human capital and that become the basis for uh, 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 capacity and how country can, uh, you know, the resilience and capacity to respond to to, to pandemic like COVID nineteen. I certainly this is a very important. There's a very important connection over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Here. Uh, are there any other questions from Zoom participants? Yeah, I'd Randy, like to, yes, yeah, I'd like to ask a question, uh, Doctor. Um, there's this uh, thesis that was actually uh, famous in the late 90s and early 2000s no, called the late development thesis that the experiences in the uh, uh, countries that have grown in Asia, the first and second waves, uh, like uh, the East Asian tigers, for example, Korea, Taiwan, and the second wave from Malaysia, Indonesia, cannot be duplicated by the by the countries that have been lagging, like the uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and, and what what do you think uh, of that thesis in the light of well, maybe now the exception is uh, Vietnam. Vietnam has been uh, mm. so fast, but um, uh, the thesis was that um, uh, these first and second wave Asian countries that grew actually have grown so fast and they're already so advanced in their value chain that uh, the other uh, lagging Asian countries cannot catch up there anymore. So I don't know if, mm. uh, what do you think of that, uh, the, that view that uh, maybe it might be difficult for these lagging countries to <laughs> Right. So, so you mean your question is whether the stories of the Korea and uh, the nine E, the four nine E is not nearly industrialized economy can be repeated by countries like Cambodia and Laos and uh, Myanmar, for instance, right? So that is your question, right? I, I think uh, yes, yes. certainly, uh, 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 you know, the, the become more challenging uh, in terms of, uh, because we here, we, we in, the, in, the, in the book, we said manufacturing 
uh, uh, has been uh, played, export has played a very important role in, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, generating growth in because all the newly industrialized economies are very open and export oriented. And uh, so uh, whether uh, uh, this uh, country's late, later comers can still uh, repeat this story. But I, I think uh, uh, at the moment, uh, of course, these countries are growing before the pandemic, they are growing at 8%, uh, 9% very high growth rate. And uh, so they are uh, uh, participating uh, in global value chain, for instance, right? The, the Cambodia and part of textile. The start, basically they are following the, uh, 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 the, the earlier success stories, uh, develop manufacturing, uh, especially uh, uh, Korea, uh, sorry, uh, Cambodia. And now of course the resource rich and uh, uh, country and uh, so that, and this is also developing tourism. So I, I think uh, we cannot see, uh, uh, we, we can certainly cannot see they will not be able to repeat, right? So uh, uh, I think that, that uh, there are opportunity the, the important thing is if they can find some rich niche area and uh, 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 in terms of uh, of course remain open and participate in global value chain would be important and to get uh, technology sort of FDI uh, initially and then you know so follow I, I think uh, there are no reason why you know they cannot uh, repeat uh, 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 the success story of other countries in Asia. Of course, I, I, I noted that I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm aware of the questions often, the thesis often highlight, but I, I, I don't believe that is true. Yeah, they really depend on the country's policies, you know, they, they adopt and, uh, uh, you know, so, so uh, good policies uh, will make them successful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I have a, one last question, a related question. Um, you said that this time the countries may be able to skip the industrialization going from agriculture to service sector. But we all know that the high income countries of today, the source of their growth is the industry because of the um, network externalities, which made the manufacturing or industrial sector the engine of growth. So if we skip that altogether, where do you see the growth coming from the service sector? Is it yeah. also this? Yeah, actually, uh, personally, uh, no, I, I, maybe I'm presentation, during the presentation, my presentation is not very clear. So basically, the, I, what I said is the book did not provide a definite answer. The question is raised, but no, no definite answer. On the other hand, I think overall, we are sympathetic about the, the view uh, that, that this cannot be bypassed. Basically, you need the manufacturing. Uh, at, okay. at least my view is, is that we need a manufacturing. Uh, of course, the country is a certain size, right? If a very small mm -hmm. economy, then of course, maybe you cannot. But the certain things are like, like the Philippines, for instance, you certainly yes. need a good manufacturing. Uh, but of course, the service sector, uh, at the same time, you need to develop, like a BPO, uh, I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, an IT, uh, uh, ICT, you know, that, 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 that sector, software, isn't it? I think these are the things. But, uh, 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 but on the other hand, we also highlight, uh, we try to be more kind of a balanced view is that there are, with rapid technology progress, uh, things can also change. So, you know, so that's why we did not provide a definite answer. But personally, my view at least is that uh, cannot be bypassed because so far, uh, ADB, other studies by colleagues, other, they all show that manufacturing is important because before you become high income, you need a good, robust manufacturing sector. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I agree with you. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think <laughs> Professor Habito has a question. No, in fact, I just wanted to uh, push further on that particular point. No? Um, again, it seems to me that uh, during the 1990s, and I was, of course, the chief economic planner at the time, some people uh, who I must say I did not agree with 
were actually thinking it was a good thing. And they, they because they called it leapfrogging, you know, uh, go, uh, leapfrogging over industrialization and going straight into the supposed uh, culmination of economic development mm -hmm. when, when services becomes the dominant sector. But in my view, uh, with hindsight actually, uh, the reason we missed out on having a more inclusive growth precisely was missing out on that in, uh, important industrialization stage wherein mm -hmm. manufacturing takes up at least 20% of, of GDP. And we never, uh, until recently, we never really got to that, no? uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, above 20% manufacturing. So to me, uh, it really, I think it reinforces your gen the general observation made in the book that mm -hmm. you really still have to go through that manufacturing, even if only for, the, for making that growth much more inclusive. Because in the Philippines, I don't know if it's unique to the Philippines, but the service growth, cyber sector growth in the Philippines is really a dichotomous service sector. You have the high value services, That's which right. however, could probably have less employment. Uh, That's right. Then. And then the low value added services, which is a lot of informal sector jobs like uh, individual vendors or, or even pedicab drivers, fishbowl vendors, which mm -hmm. is I think about more or less the other half of the services sector, which are not exactly remunerative jobs. So I keep pointing out to my audiences you know, up to now you know, that, that the fact that we missed out on a, a, a strong industrialization stage is a a very important reason why our growth, uh, quite unlike the rest of the region, was not inclusive. And I like pointing out, for example, how in the first decade of the 2000s, we had an accelerated economic growth. And then our uh, poverty incidence actually rose between 2003 and 2009. And again, this was a period, I guess, where it was services that was actually growing the fastest. So again, it's both the high value but low employing services sector, uh, because I'm, I'm talking about bank, I'm talking about real estate, yes. you know. mm -hmm. uh, maybe BPOs is more employment intensive, but then again, mm -hmm. fin uh, financial sector is the one driving it really. And then of course the low quality type of services sector jobs. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you, Juzong, because I don't remember the data from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, was there another country in, in the region that essentially had this leapfrogging experience like the Philippines, or were, or were we really unique on that? Uh, you mean the, in terms of a sh uh, share, share of the manufacturing sector? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in effect, moving yeah. almost straight from agriculture dominance yeah. to I, I think it, dominance. Yeah, I think the often the countries cite the, you know, in <clears throat> the Philippines and another is India. Uh, India. Yeah, 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 India, that's right. But the India, of course, uh, there were the big discussions, you know, uh, similar as in, in the Philippines, whether manufacturing is important, uh, important. Uh, but, but the government, uh, as the Indian government has made it clear that they want to make, develop manufacturing. And there are, the, you know, plans, you know, you know the long-term and medium-term plans to, uh, to, to develop manufacturing sector. And, and they are making good progress on, on that respect i think so so if the answer to your question is another country often cited the indian uh, uh, uh you know the, the issue of discussion on whether this can be flawed and then can bypass the manufacturing or industrialization i guess it all boils down if we can measure the network externalities created by these bpos and kpos as opposed to the network externalities created by the industrial sector then we can say which one right. would really be the engine of growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think the, the service sector, as a professor happy to mention, the job creation the service sector, you know, is limited, right? And then yeah, have a, yeah. Uh, very few high paid jobs, uh, but many mm -hmm. very low paid jobs, right? Mm -hmm. But the manufacturing uh, sector, you have a more kind of a balanced, more high paid job, better, more better paid jobs create. So that makes Grows more inclusive. Uh, yes. Yeah. Dr. Zhuang, can you entertain one more question? There's another question from one of the faculty, the dean actually of the business school, uh, right. Louis. Okay. Can you ask your question? Yeah, uh, I, I just want to start first with the Philippine experience. Before the beginning of the century, when we speak of trade, it's always our trade with the United States and then 
uh, far second Japan and, and so on and so forth. But, but now the, the change has totally changed. Uh, 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 our number one trade partner, for instance, is uh, China and Japan, and third only the USA. Regionally speaking, our biggest trade partner is ASEAN 5. So I guess what I'm saying is a uh, uh, post-global financial crisis, Asian economies started to trade south-south as opposed to north-south. So my question is, how has this affected the Asian experience the past 10 years? And how will this change the game the next 10 years? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, the change in trade patterns uh, in terms of trade partners uh, to some extent uh, 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 is because of the rising global value chain. So uh, for instance, a lot of trade between China and uh, within uh, uh, Asia, within Asia, a lot of trade uh, are intermediate trade in intermediate goods and parts and components. Uh, then the final goods uh, are still, you know, of course, I mean, increasing in Asia, but uh, uh, it, uh, a large part is go to the developed in the U.S. and uh, and and the uh, European countries, advanced markets, right? So, why in terms of looking at the share, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of Philippines, China became a, a larger. Uh, uh, trade partners, but uh, the content of the trade uh, very much dominated, for instance, by intermediate goods. Uh, so, so I think that to some extent because of that, but of course, the other things, uh, trade is increasing, uh, has been increasing uh, uh, within Asia, uh, even final goods also increasing. But the larger part, I think, is because of in trade in intermediate goods, the parts and components, because of the rising global value chain. So uh, how that uh, uh, affected trade, uh, uh, I think global value chain, of course, uh, uh, has now because of the COVID-19, uh, there's the concern maybe too extensive or there's a call for maybe, you know, uh, a, a moderate uh, kind of uh, efforts. But I think global value chain will remain uh, 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 you know, uh, but of course you need to co consider uh, uh, I mean, when the efficiency, the other wing is the life safety, right? So uh, like medical supply, for instance, uh, that often incited uh, as a, a problem in the global value chain because of the, uh, the you know, when you're in the kind of situation and then you found you know where to get the, the medical supply. Uh, but that, that, but overall my view is the global value chain has served the region well and the global is the, is the global economy well, it will remain, will remain important. So I, I don't know whether this answers your question, but my I, I, the direct answer is that the changing pattern to some extent driven by the rise of the global value chain, the trade in intermediate goods and the parts and components. So uh, you look at the, uh, the, the total volume, yes, China or other countries can be, but if you look at the value added, maybe not. So thank you for the insight. But but even in services, in trade, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in tourism, it used to be north. Yeah, south. yeah, yes, yeah. The yeah. service, yeah. So the, the service sector is trade. Yeah, that, yeah. I, yeah, that's a good point. Well, well as as a, as a the country and region become richer, and then the uh, tourism certainly increase, and uh, uh, so so that that certainly uh, it will become more and more important. Uh, you know. Uh, after, especially after COVID-19, the trade, the tourism will remain. I hope it will, you know, will resume and uh, uh, grow, continue to grow, and with effective vaccine and uh, treatment. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that, that, that's, uh, that's interesting, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I think that is all the time that we have for Q&A, but before we end, uh, let me invite you first to our next seminar which will be on November 25. So the poster is coming in. So our seminar will be on November 25 on the topic, do households in developing countries choose energy efficient air conditioner? And we will have a speaker from Fukui for Factual University, Dr. Miwa Nakai. So 
um, please join me for those who are um, of you in the on Facebook and also in Zoom. Please join me in thanking Dr. Zhuang for giving us a very extensive and very interesting seminar today. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhuang. And thank you to all the, those who joined us on Facebook for joining us today in this seminar. So we hope to see you again um, next you. month for another seminar. Thank so you very for much. those who are in Zoom, yes, Dr. Zhuang. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for your excellent moderation. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank, thank you, everyone, everyone, for your participation. Okay, so for those who are in Zoom, please stay, and then we will go offline on Facebook. Thank you.